good morning. Let me get this fixed. I hope every one of you is doing good today. Thank you for joining in. Today we're going to be studying part two of Why You Need Your Enemies and Your Enemies Need You um, by Ray Pritchard. And it was a lot of knowledge that I gave out last, the part one last time I was on live. And it was just so much information and it helped you to look at it in such a spirit, look at things and situations and trials in our life in such a different way, a spiritual way. So I just, uh, if you wasn't able to look at that video, please go back on Be The Light page, this page, and um, scroll and find the last video and watch it, and it will catch you up. You can take notes. You can look up the scriptures that I put on there for you, and so it'll catch you up to this video. We just want to open in prayer. Y'all pray with me. God, we just thank you so much for this day. We ask you, Father, just to open our hearts and our minds, God, to receive what you have for us to receive this day in your word and in this teaching. Lord, I pray, God, that you would use me as an instrument, Lord, to only speak what you would have me to speak. That, God, you would take the blinders off the minds, Lord, and just draw people to your word and help help it to change our lives forever. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. So, it's not, I don't think this lesson's as long as last one, but we're going to get right on in it. So, last week we was uh, really focusing on Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. And it says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, when you read and meditate on that scripture, um, you'll get the gist of it. God is telling his people, and he's talking to them when they're in exile. They're in bondage. They're in a really bad place in life. And God put them there in that bad place so, but due to their disobedience and their stubbornness. Um, so he's telling them, okay, while you're in this place that I put you, really that you put yourself because of your disobedience and rebellion, seek the prosperity of the people around you. Pray to the Lord for your enemies in Babylon where you're at. Because if they prosper, if your enemies prosper, then you will prosper too. So that's really hard. If you'll go back and watch that the last video where we studied, I went into great detail of how these Babylonians were, and they were just vile devils, you know, they were just bad people beyond paganism. They raped, murdered, left and right. So it was hard to pray for those people, just like a lot of times it's hard for us to pray for people that have wronged us or that do wrong in general, you know, um, like... How many people have ever wanted to pray for Hitler when he was still alive, you know? Because he was so treacherous in all ways. But God's Word teaches us to pray for your enemies and bless them and not curse them. And in doing so, you will be blessed. So, vessels are used by God. And, and that's what I want to tell you now. Vessels are used by God. Whether we're vessels of the Lord or vessels that are not of God, they're still used by God because the enemy cannot do anything unless God allows him to do it. God is sovereign. He is in full control. And that may build up some resentment because if you've been through a lot in life and you've been through a lot of pain and you think, well, the devil did that, the devil did that, but then you go deeper in your mind spiritually and you think well the devil might have did do it but God had to okay it so God had me go through this for a reason and the reason is and it'll tell you that um, what is sometimes meant by some to hurt us actually helps to bring out a work of grace 
a work of grace in us that wouldn't take place in any other way. And that's a great example of what I've been through in life. And I know there's probably many, many people that's been through a lot. But, you know, God knows us really well. And he knows every detail of us. He knows more about us than we do. And so to bring about that work that he wants to establish in our lives, to bring about the work he wants to do within us, to mold us, to graft us, make us who he wants us to be throughout this life. He may have to allow us to go through some really bad stuff. He knows what's best though. Romans 8 and 28 promises that he knows the best. All things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and those that are called according to to his purpose. So if you've been called according to the purposes of God and you truly love the Lord, he's going to work it out. He's going to work it out for the best, for his glory and for our good. It might not happen overnight. It might take years, but it will. His word does not lie. He will establish his word. Okay, we're going to go on a little further. When an enemy attacks... God exposes the sinful blind spots that lie hidden within my heart, within your heart. When friends extol my good virtues and praise me and appreciate me and, oh, you're such a powerful woman of God or whatever, I appreciate their expressions of love. But it is more important that I be told the truth about myself, especially if it even wounds me deeply. You see, we need to know the truth. Yes, we do need encouragement and we do need people in our life to let us know how important we are and how we're loved and to lift us up in times of bad times, you know, bad days we may be having and things we may go through. But what about the hidden places within, deep within us? How can God expose us and how can God expose those hidden places when somebody's always patting you on the back? He has to use people. He has to use people that might get on your nerves to expose that you have impatience inside of you. He may have to, you know, uh, let somebody rub you the wrong way and aggravate the poo out of you before you see, boy, I got a lack of self-control in me. I need to work on the love that's in my life. He, just like I said, when an enemy attacks in any way, shape, or form, when something happens that you don't like, God exposes that sinful blind spot that lies hidden in your heart. In Proverbs 27, verse 6, write that down if you're taking notes. It's very important that we be told the truth, especially even if it wounds us deeply. Um, one second. Otherwise, it will not work to become, we will not, it will not work us out to become more like Christ. And the blind spots that we have will grow. They will grow and they will further infect our soul. You see, it. If those blind spots, if God don't show us things about ourselves, we shouldn't be looking around at other people all the time, looking at them. And I know we do, but we shouldn't. We should look in the mirror. And how do you do it? You look in the Word of God. And that Word of God is that double-edged sword that pierces us, that shows us, hey, boy, you need to work on that area inside of you, Jackie. You need help in that area. And so, that's how God shows us. And then we can get that old mess out of us. There are lessons I must learn that can only be learned in the crucible of adversity, pain, and difficulty. There are lessons to be learned in the hardships that we go through. God uses those perceived as enemies to expose the things that are otherwise would never be seen. Listen to that, y'all. Go back if you have to. Rewind this. 
God uses those perceived as enemies, the ones we think, oh my goodness, I got to deal with this one again today. No, don't think that way. Think spiritually. Praise God. I'm going to get refined some today because I'm going to be around this individual that the enemy thinks he's using, but God's really using this person to rub me, shine on me, get some mess out of me, to expose some things I need to work on and I need to allow God to work on to make me whiter than snow, to make me look more like Christ Jesus. That's how we need to go around thinking about things. So when we see, oh, well, they're perceived as enemies to expose the things, otherwise we would never even see within ourselves, much less understand or remove from our life. And so what some might be called an enemy is really our helpers. See, a tool used from God for our good. So if we go around thinking about people, situations, and things like that, like going into Walmart, dealing with people, dealing with people's impatience, dealing with people's lack of respect. If you go around in traffic, you know, or drive-throughs, things that you go through during the day, people that might rub you the wrong way in your family, or at your workplace, or at church, don't think of them as, well, the devil's using them again. Oh, goodness. Here I am at Walmart. The devil's going to have a heyday. No. No. Cut that out. Don't let Satan be glorified in any way, shape, or form. God uses those tools. God uses that hectic traffic to expose things inside of us that we need to work on. God uses those people that have lack of respect in Walmart because, see, they might not see or read God's Word. They might not ever even pick it up. The only God's Word that those disrespectful, impatient people might see is us. So are they going to see us snatch our buggy and say, oh, excuse you, or what you know? Or are they going to see you smile and say, God bless you today? I'm praying for you. Sorry, you're having a bad day, you know. Um, we have got to really make our minds think spiritually because we're in this human form. And it's going to be automatic to think carnally and to act out with this flesh. We've got to keep this thing under control. The more of God's Word we read, the more we're going to feed the Spirit within us. And it's going to guide us and lead us. Hey, Kay, thank you so much for being with me today. If y'all are with me watching, let me know. That way I can see. I can't uh, see who is watching with me unless y'all comment or, or like be a part of the lesson with me. So feel free to do that. For the way to Christ likeness is to the cross. Was the cross pretty? Was the cross good? Was it a great thing Jesus had to experience? No. So carrying the cross and following Jesus, is that going to be easy always? No. Is it going to be easy when somebody treats you ugly and you have to treat them good because you want to respect God more than you want to get back at that person? You know, let's gain control over the battlefield which is the brain the mind behind who we are and i'm not sitting here look i'm not sitting here acting like miss perfect because i've got issues and i got a mouth and i've got an attitude just like anybody else and anybody knows me personally y'all know i'm jacking <laughs> i mean but i'm learning all this and i'm you know, building myself, and I'm teaching as I'm going, and we learn and we grow together in Christ Jesus, and that's how I see it. So, being that Christ's likeness is through the cross and the navigator that God uses to direct us there are those who might be called enemies. God uses enemies in our life. God uses aggravating circumstances the bad valleys in our life as navigation, as tools to refine us, 
to mold us in that fire, to make us come out looking like a diamond. That's what he does. So it's not the devil using this or that, or the devil, the devil, no, don't, don't say nothing about it. He's defeated. He can't do nothing unless God allows him to. Thank you, Sister Kay. I appreciate that encouragement. Thank you. Without people doing what they think will hurt us or destroy us, we would never find out the way to be more like Jesus. You see that? If we never had to drive in traffic, if we never had to deal with people that like Jesus, that don't have respect, or that rub us the wrong way, if we never had to deal with any of that, how would we be refined? How would we come out looking more Christ-like? How would we, you know, be molded and shaped to become more like God if we didn't have to go through those places or deal with those people? We would never become more like Jesus if we didn't have to go through the tests and the schooling of this. They are a required part of becoming holy. And because of that, we must see them as tools of God. Not the enemy's hand in it. Not the devil's using so-and-so. Or boy, the devil's tackling me through this illness. No, look at it as God's tools. Just because something's unpleasant, just because something is bad that we deal with, that don't necessarily... God's still in control of that too, y'all. He's still in control of it, and he's going to use it for our good one way or the other. He's going to use it for his glory, and he's going to... If I hadn't went through everything I've been through, I wouldn't be here with you right now. I wouldn't be able to teach. I wouldn't have the time to study the Word of God and... Maybe to be in this place of maturity in the Lord had I not lost everything I had. So, see, God's working it out. It might not have been the way I wanted it worked out. No, it wasn't. No, and it may not ever be the way I wanted it to, but it's okay because either I'm going to be God's tool and be used or I'm not. You see, things that don't go right, things that's horrible that we go through, that don't mean God don't love us. It means he's working through us somehow or another, whether we like it or not. It is, it is not enough to simply say we believe that God has a purpose in everything that happens to us. That much is true. But this reading of what we're learning suggests, with biblical support, that God always has a beneficial purpose, though we often do not see it clearly especially at the time that it's going on. Might look back over years, I know y'all do, and y'all like, hmm, I see now why God might have let, and you might not ever see it. You might just have to say, God, I trust you. No matter what I go through or what I've went through, I trust you because you see all things, you know all things, and you're in control of all things. Either I'm going to trust you and live for you, or I'm going to lay down and be destroyed. And that was my options. That was my literal options. So, I want to see my family one day in heaven. I want to see my king one day. I want to run again with my legs and jump in my master's arms. And I want to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. So, am I going to lay down and grovel and die spiritually and, and physically because of what I've endured? No. I will not die. There's a scripture I painted up here. Psalm, Psalms 118 verse 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord is what I'm going to do. I will live and declare the works of the Lord. I will not die. Did I want to die? Yes. Every now and then I might still do. But I won't. I won't. Because I love God more than I love this old stinking flesh. I'm not going to give it what it wants. So, let's move on. Sorry for getting upset, but that's just the Lord moving and leading. 
Okay, with all this in mind that we learned, even last video, uh, the last lesson, part one, we turn to the very practical question of how we are supposed to respond to those who hurt us deeply. Jesus told us how we're supposed to respond in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, if you take in notes, to love your enemies. Easier said than done, especially when you are in the middle of an ugly conflict, especially when your heart has been broken in two. In the, the particular case of Jeremiah 29, the Jews had been forcibly deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. They were their slaves. Many of their leaders had been killed, and many had been marched away in shackles. The Babylonians were quite, quite ruthless in their treatment of their enemies, and now the Jews were in exile, they found out, for 70 years. Hey, Misty, thank you for being with me. For 70 years, which meant, at least for the older folks, that most of them would never even return home again. Most of them would never be delivered from exile. You know, that some of this was a new generation that, that the Jews would be born into this slavery who wasn't even guilty of being disobedient, you know? So sometimes you just dealt a, a rotten hand, but you got to deal with it, you know? Deal with it and trust God. So what does it mean to love the people who have ruined everything you hold dear? What does it mean to love them? How do you pray for someone you despise? How do you seek the good of people you wish were dead? I mean, these are hard questions, but I come up with them and, you know, how do you do this? How do you how do you pray for somebody you just can't stand and you wish was dead? How do you survive in a foreign land where everything you believe is ridiculed? And we're talking about the Jews right now. But somehow, some of these questions are hitting home. You think, well, Jackie, how in the world would you ever hate somebody or wish they was dead? Because I'm human and because I've been done terrible. Because I have loved people and given to people from the very depths of my soul. And I've had them turn around and destroy me. To Like this scripture, uh... I can't see it from up there, but about don't cast your goodness and your pearls before the swine, lest they turn and tear you to shreds. I have experienced that scripture literally. So, you want to know how I do these things? Thank you, Misty. I'm so glad you're with me. I love doing these Bible studies. I will have to tell you the truth. It is a battle every time I do it. That's why a lot of times I don't do it every week because I fight with my flesh. My flesh does not want to do these videos. My flesh does not want to do the testimonies on here. I don't know why because once I do it, I feel so free and good about it. But to just get to this room to do it, I fight spiritual battles, man. So that's how I know that God uses these Bible studies because I wouldn't have to fight so bad spiritually if they weren't doing something good, you know. But anyway, back to what I was saying. How how do you pray for someone that has ruined your life? How do you pray for someone that you hate and even have wanted dead? Well, here's how you do it. Here's how I do it. And I'm going to finish reading this. Why, let me finish reading this part. Why would you seek their prosperity after what they did to you? Why do you do, what do you do when you don't like the circumstances of your life? And it seems as if those circumstances aren't going to change anytime soon or ever. I'm never going to have my children back on this earth. I'm never going to grow my legs back unless God does a wonderful miracle. And I know he can. I just don't know if he wants to. And this is just me being so honest. Just being honest. The way I do it, <clears throat> a lot of things in life, just like I don't feel like I want to do these Bible studies. I don't feel like getting up, transferring from my bed to a wheelchair. I don't feel like going through some days. I don't feel like praying some days. 
I don't feel like reading my Bible some days. And I'm just being honest. I don't know if y'all may feel the same way, if y'all have to deal with this. I don't want to forgive sometimes. I don't feel like loving the person that drove my car and wouldn't stop it that day and killed my children and took my life. Do you think I feel like loving him or praying for that person? Never. So what do I do? Well, you got a choice. You're either going to die with bitterness and hate and anger, and it's going to destroy you. It will. It'll destroy you, and you will not be effective for the kingdom of God. Well, I want to be effective for the kingdom of God. I want to be used, and I want to make it home one day. So what do I do? I do not base what I do off of my feelings. You cannot live each day. You cannot forgive your enemies. You cannot pray for your enemies based on how you feel. This flesh right here is what's feeling. You can't, The flesh. You can't live by the flesh. You got to live by the Spirit of God. You got to obey God's Spirit. And even if I don't feel like loving, feel like praying, I do it. I do it because it's not about what Jackie feels like. It's not about what I may feel because that's carnality. It's about resisting the flesh, denying the flesh. The same way if somebody wanted to have an affair or do drugs, do you just go and do it because you feel like doing it? You shouldn't. You should deny the flesh in the same manner that I just talked about. And you should say, no, no flesh. You don't dominate me. Carnality behind me in the name of Jesus. And then you say, you know what? I love this person because God said to, he commanded me to. I love you and I know that God made you. And I, I ask you God to forgive this person. And Lord, help me forgive this person. And I do forgive him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Because it's not based on what we feel, y'all. It's based on obeying God. So that's what I do. Maybe, you know, we could get on a Zoom one day and y'all could share with me how y'all do it. But here is God unfolding answers for the Jews and for us. Number one, you are where you are because I put you there. That's a matter of fact. <laughs> That's God. This is God talking about Jeremiah's letter to the Jews. Settle down. Number two, settle down and make the best of your situation. Okay? And these, let me just go back and show you. This is, uh, let me show you these verses that go with this. I don't, I'm not just saying this. I'm going to give you the verses. Jeremiah 29 verse 4. Okay? It's pretty much telling you you are where you are because I put you there. Number 2 verses 4 through 6. Settle down and make the best of your situation. Just go ahead and settle down. You got to make the best of it. Where are you in life? Where are you? Are you transferring from a bed to a chair? You might as well just go ahead and suck it up. Praise God when you're doing it. Thank God I got a wheelchair. Thank you, Lord, I got an electric one too. Because God uses people to give me things like that. You know, I just thank God for what I do have. It, you can't focus on the things you don't have. Because that's really depressing. Uh, in verse 7, number 3. Seek the good of the city and pray for those who have taken you into exile. Has someone taken you into exile? Has someone taken you someplace to where you find it hard to love them or forgive them? And you're talking about them all the time. You're thinking bad thoughts about them. You're being critical. Has someone took you there? Has someone took you to exile even when you was an innocent little child? Has someone took you to exile? Well, as bad as that exile may be, God allowed it. God allowed it. He is sovereign and he allowed it. And we have to trust him. 
He loves us. He wants the best for us, even if it don't feel like it. We don't understand it. It don't matter. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not ours. He's higher than ours. We are tools. We are clay. And he uses his instruments, which is us, to help others. If people never went through a bad place in their childhood, like most of y'all probably know about what Joyce Myers went through as a child. I don't want to just come out and say it. Y'all know what I mean. Um, if you don't, if somebody hadn't went through them, how are they going to have a testimony to help others through that one day? Do you see what I'm saying? If someone never lost a child, how do you encourage someone that has lost a child and that's suicidal? How, if you've never been there and done that, how can God use you as that tool? If you've never been a drug addict or an alcoholic, how, and God's delivered you, how can you be that tool or that instrument to say, hey, you know what? I was there and my God seen me and he delivered me from that pit. He pulled me up out of that miry clay, hallelujah, and he set my feet on a rock. And this is what he'll do for you too because he loves you and he wants to use you. And that is how it works. And I'm getting all upset and getting off my lesson and Anyway, in part one of this message, we discuss two key questions. Where does my enemies come from and who are my enemies? Here are seven suggestions that will move us in the right direction on how to love our enemies. So y'all take notes. If y'all don't have your notebook and your Bible right now, take notes, okay? Here is what you do. I'm going to move through it quickly because they are a little bit longer. But there's seven ways for us to love our enemies. Now, I just told you how I go about doing it most of the time. Greet your enemies. And, you know, I've heard people say, I've heard a couple people in my life say, just stand on the sidelines and do this. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. That God, God is looking at your heart and your motives, and he don't like fake. It ain't about if you pretend and all that. No, God don't like that. He don't honor it, and I don't like it either. That's why you'll get to know me through these sessions and studies. I'm very honest, even if it makes me ugly, and that's just the way it is. That's how God uses people. An ugly testimony is the testimony that God uses the most. And that's what I believe. So you greet your enemies and you don't be fake about it. We often overlook the simple step. One part of loving our enemies is to greet them graciously when we see them. They are God's creation. Remember that. God made them people in his beautiful image. And he made them for his purposes, okay? So whether they're his vessel or whether they're not his vessel, he still uses them. They're vessels and he made them. So let's think of that when you look at somebody and you're like, oh Lord, let me get out of here. No, we're not supposed to do that, y'all. We're supposed to really say, you know, God made this person. Let me love them. Let me love them like God does. And I haven't always done that. And like, you know, I have pretty much kind of isolated myself in a sense, and um, I know people may not think that that's good or right, but God has really helped me through it. Um, he has helped me study more and de to detach myself more from worldliness, kind of. And so I have learned that, you know, a year and a half ago, I gossiped a lot. And I talked about people a lot and things. So I don't do that much because... I don't talk to many people, <laughs> but anyway, um, so you greet them graciously. Sometimes, often perhaps, instead of turning the other cheek, we turn away so we won't have to say hello to someone who has hurt us or someone we don't like. Some of us have been quick to uh, use looking the other way, ducking into a room or crossing the street or even using caller ID to keep from greeting those who have hurt us. That if we only greet our friends, 
What benefit is that to us? How are we being different than people that are lost in the world? Do not even sinners greet each other? One part of loving your enemies is to greet them instead of avoiding them. Number two, disarm them. That's what you do when you turn the other cheek or go the second mile. You disarm them by doing the very thing they least expect. You do it by speaking well of them when no one expects it. You do it by speaking well of them in front of them and behind their backs when no one expects it. People will honor you better when you talk good about somebody and they're all talking bad. You might be out of their clique, but praise God, you're back with the Lord where you need to be. You do it by speaking well of them when no one expects it. Um, I'm not going to read that part because that's long. Okay, going down to number three. Do good to them. It means seeing them as people made in the image of God and understanding that there is something twisted inside that causes them to do what they do. And that twisting might be blinders on their mind. You know, if they're lost or even if, you know, they're not where they need to be with God, we need to pray for them people, for real. If you got a relationship with God and you need, you are where you need to be with the Lord, then we shouldn't talk about them or criticize them in front of them or behind their back. We should really pray for them because we want people to have what we have if we're right, you know? I don't know if that came out right. But anyway, doing good means that you do what will promote their healing despite the way they have treated you. That's hard to do, but you can do it with the Spirit of God. If the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, if you are the temple of Christ Jesus, you can do all things through Christ. Nothing is impossible. And that's the word. I don't know right now where the scripture's at, but that is the word of God I just said. So you can do these things. Number four, refuse to speak evil of them. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Bless those who curse you in Luke, four, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 28. It means you choose not to think evil thoughts. Now, that might be a little more difficult than closing your mouth about them, than thoughts. We got to cast them down. If you think bad about somebody and you think bad thoughts, it will take you over. I have had that happen to me. And one time, and there's nobody, I'm not blaming anybody except myself. I'm not talking about anybody. I'm blaming me. And it is the truth. I'm not just saying that. It was Jackie. I didn't like someone. I didn't like anything about this person. And it literally made me sick, spiritually and physically sick. And so being that I thought this way, and I was around this person some, and that rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, looking at this person, it made me to where I couldn't even worship. Enter into the presence of God. And and it also, them thoughts entered out right out to my mouth. And I was talking bad about this person to this one, this one, this one, this one. And then it created a chain, you see. And instead of me being a child of God the way I was supposed to be, I was creating bad thinking and seeds and thoughts and, and all that to other people. And that's, I was doing that. Don't, let's don't do that, y'all. I mean, God had to show me not to do that. That was so ugly. But when I was in it, when I was doing it, my brain was blind of it. I didn't even realize that I was doing it wrong. I didn't even realize that I was in the wrong. And and that how it, that's how it goes sometimes. You know, you won't know. Boy, I was some self-righteous thing. Good gracious. I, I was gossiping. I was criticizing. And I was spreading those little, sprinkling those seeds on other sisters in the Lord. And created a chain reaction of negativity. A chain reaction of gossip. You know, God was not proud of that. And so... Um, anyway, let's, let's just don't do that. So doing good means that you do what will promote their healing despite the way they've treated you. And we're skipping down. Uh, you ch it means you choose not to think evil thoughts and you refuse to speak evil words against those people that have wronged you. 
Proverbs has a great deal to say about the power of the tongue. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. Will eat of its fruit. So every time we open our mouth, y'all, it's either life we're speaking or it's death. It's death. So forgiveness in many cases is not possible because we won't stop talking about it. See, that's how come we still got unforgiveness and bitterness and hate and stuff in us towards a situation or a person because we won't stop talking about it. And that's how I used to be. Something happened. I had to call 10, 20 people before I felt gratified or whatever. And it was ridiculous. And I thank God for taking that away from me. And I'm ashamed of how I was. And I'm not going to do that no more. So I have repented. And it's not right. And I don't want to be that way. It's not pleasing to God. As long as we talk over and over again about how others have done us, we will never find the strength to forgive. We will never let it go if we keep thinking and talking about it. At some point, we got to stop talking and thinking about it and start forgiving because, you know, God, did, that's not optional. And, you know, me and my husband, we say this um, with the Lord's Prayer every night before we go to bed. And it says, uh, I'm not going to say it all. Hang on. <laughs> he remembers it better than me. Uh, let's see. Lead us not to temptation. Help us to forgive others who trespass against us as you forgive. All right. Let's see. How does that go? Okay. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us of our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. I had to go from the top to remember it. But do you hear that? We're asking God, Lord, forgive me how I forgive others. <laughs> That's scary. We're want, I mean, if we don't have if we don't give people but 10% forgiveness, we're asking God, well, I need 100% forgiveness, but only forgive me 10% of forgiveness because that's what I forgive others. I hope I'm making sense, but God showed me that one day, and I was like, forgive others of their trespasses, of how I forgive them of their trespasses, you know? So we, it's, a, it's not an option. We are commanded to forgive, for God to be able to forgive us. So God was telling them, you can criticize the Babylonians, you can hate them, or you can pray for them. But you can't do both at the same time. <laughs> you cannot do both at the same time. Oh my. Yes, we will never seek the good of the city as long as we hate the people of that city. What God said to the exiles applies directly to us. We will never seek the good of our enemies. And we till we stop thinking and speaking evil of them. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, you must believe that your enemy is sent to you by God's design and with God's approval. Your enemy could not torment you apart from God's permission. Behind your enemy stands the hand of God, and God would never permit it if he did not intend to bring something good out of it. So number six is you pray for them. But what if you hate the person you're praying for, right? Tell that to the Lord. He's not surprised. He already knows how bad you hurt. He knows and sees bitterness. He knows. Then say something like this to the Lord. Lord, I cannot stand this person. But you already know that. I ask you to help to love this person through me because I cannot do it on my own power, God. I can't do it. I need you to do it through me. I ask you for a love I don't have and that I cannot produce on my own. And I've done that many times. And it's not a twinkle that happens right that minute. 
But if you start praying that every every time you think about somebody that you you know that's hurt you, or every time you want to talk about that person, say that prayer instead. God, I don't like her, but I can't. I want to, but I don't. So I'm asking you, love her through me. Forgive her through me because I don't have the power or strength to do it on my own. God is our Father. He loves for us to come to Him like that with complete honesty. There ain't no sense in trying to hide nothing from the Lord. He sees it all. God will not turn you away when you come with an honest heart. He will not. He will help you. And so you ask God, number seven, to bless them. Here's a simple way to do that. When faced with someone who has mistreated you, ask God to do for them what God has done for you. The greater the hurt, the greater the potential blessing that will come when we forgive from the heart and by God's grace, bless those who curse us. Jesus had enemies. They killed him. They love, he loved them anyway. Don't you want to be like Jesus? We want to be like Jesus. And I know it's difficult. Hey, Amber. Hey, Deborah. Thank you for joining in with me. I want to remind y'all, please go to the last video. That was part one of this study. It is just awesome to see and look at the sovereignty of God. And these lessons are teaching us how to do that and how to see enemies and is not just like a tool of the enemy, but God uses that too. So kind of good in that area, but I'm almost done with our study and I'm going to close with that. Think about how Jesus didn't do anything but good to people. He loved people more than we could ever love anyone. And, and what did they do? They treated him bad. They talked about him. They even said he was a Beelzebub. I mean, how horrible could that be to say that about Jesus? They ridiculed him. They betrayed him. And they killed him. They thought that he rose from the dead, of course. And he has got a place being prepared for us now. But, do you want to be like Jesus? He says it's kind of what he did for us. I would rather die than hate you. So we have to die to ourself, die to our flesh before we are ugly or hate or unforgive or not forgive someone else. I love you ladies. I know this was a long lesson and last one is too, but I just asked y'all to get a pen and paper. Um, take notes. I'm going to put on Be The Lights page some scriptures that I looked up that go with this lesson. I thank each and every one of y'all for joining in. Uh, y'all share these videos if you want to. Get the Word of God out. Um, it's about God's Word. It's about looking at things with a kingdom mindset of God. Spiritually minded. And we can do it because if we're a vessel of the Spirit of God in us, we're able to do this. It is not easy. I promise you, I know. I know it's not easy always. But like I said, if you hate someone, if you do, if you wish bad on them, you know, if you've been hurt and betrayed by them after helping them and being good to them, I know that feeling. Just tell God the truth about how you feel, and tell love these people through me, God. Help me to forgive these people the way you've forgiven me. I love y'all. We're gonna do part th um, part with. We did, let's see, part one and part two, why you need your enemies. Next one, um, next week, we're going to do how to be happy in Babylon. So the part one and part two was why you need your enemies and your enemies need you. Go back, watch this video and the last video. And then this next one is going to be how to be happy in Babylon. And Babylon is exile. How to be happy in the valley. Yeah, the valley of the shadow of death. How to be happy there. So, it's going to be great. And we're going to have a lot of scriptures to go along with it. It's going to be a longer lesson. So, if you can't jump on and be with me live, just or even if you want to be on with me live later on when you got spare time, go back and listen to it. Stop, start it, write down these scriptures, meditate it, and let the Spirit of God work 
in you what God is trying to work through me is too. I love y'all. Y'all have a blessed day.